Hi, everybody. This is Crypto Rich, working with you to get rich with crypto, filling our pockets with crypto profits. I'm thrilled and delighted to have Synth with me. He's one of the co-founders of Skycoin, and I do do enjoy uh, these conversations because of the insight that Synth provides about what's happening in the crypto space and the market in general. And also, it's an opportunity for people who are holders of Sky to find out what's happening with the Skycoin project. Tired of just playing for fun? Make a living just by playing your favorite games. You can make anywhere from 1% to 1,000% return depending on the difficulty of the game. Play, win, earn, bet verse. Hey Synth, how you doing? Hey, how's it going? It's going very, very well. Now you're a little bit laid back because you're a bit under the weather. Right? <laughs> I want to move. <laughs> you don't want to move, right? <laughs> But I, I appreciate you doing this. And we're recording this a couple of days after we did that uh, video with uh, mm. seven, six other projects represented on that. Mm. So if there's anything you want to say about that, uh, otherwise... That interview was really good. I like that well, one. One second, one second. Sorry. Otherwise, we're going to cover uh, Skycoin developments and the state of the market. Yep. So anything you want to say about that interview, which, by the way, you can find on my channel on BitTube TV by the time this goes out in full length. So please subscribe. I, I like went to a lot of conferences and I didn't actually meet a lot of blockchain people because the, you know, a lot of the, the serious projects aren't like traveling or going to all these conferences and, you know, mostly people trying to do ICOs. So I, I don't, so I, I like that because I met like two or three people. Like I met the BitTube guy, I met the, uh, the guy doing the Steam social media platform and, uh, you know, it's just interesting to bring together the different people in crypto because, uh, you know, I've had 20 conferences. I've only met like maybe one or two people that were actually doing something. So really that, you know, interesting. Yeah. Wow. 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 Okay. Well, uh, for those not confirmed yet, and we don't have definite dates, but for those watching, um, we are going to be, I am going to be organizing a video between synth and some of the other projects that were on there. So we're going to discuss particular issues relevant to the three projects. And what I liked about it, synth is like you said, all those projects that were on there, Komodo, Atomic Dex, which was part of Komodo, three speaker online, BitTube, Top Beat, TV, Skycoin, and Holochain. And by the way, Vsys cancelled at the last minute. The guy had to fly, right? But they're, they are, like you said, they're all building stuff. They're not asking for money, uh, although I'm sure they wouldn't say no to it. But uh -huh. they are actually building products, all of them. Okay, so any, anything else you want to say about that or you want to move on to letting us know about what's happening with Skycoin? Well, I think we should talk about the market first of all. So uh, the, market, the bubble is coming back like really fast. I think Bitcoin hit over 10,000 um, this week. Everyone's getting excited. A lot of people, new people are coming back into the altcoin space. And what we've seen for the last two years was just like a death march. It was every single year, um, you know, more just people leaving, the, the, you know, everyone's dying. Everyone's, you know, having trouble doing ICOs and uh, you know and basically you just saw a lot of projects failing and there wasn't really a lot of interest in the blockchain market and I think we're it looks like there's a recovery and it looks like we're going back into uh, an upward market for the first time in two years so that you know I was getting really excited right now yes. I'm not gonna say the bubbles back yet because we had a lot of <laughs> false starts before but <laughs> yes now where, where do you see uh, Bitcoin going if the price wise in terms of before the halving, after the halving, later on this year, next year. There's a lot of crazy stuff that's going on. So like um, whenever there's a lot of turbulence or, you know, chaos, like Venezuela is collapsing, Argentina is collapsing or people are rioting in France or, you know, Turkey, Turkey devalued the lira 50 percent. Or we had a, you know, twenty five trillion dollar bank bailout, you know, every 2008 financial crisis. Every time there's a lot of uncertainty or war um, in the market, what we see is that you know gold goes up and Bitcoin goes up. So I think that Bitcoin is like a, a financial asset where we have a financial bubble, and it's also like a hard asset like gold. So it acts like a commodity when we're having a commodity bubble, and it acts like a uh, financial asset when we're having a financial bubble, which is you know really strange for an asset. So I think it's a safety asset. And what happened before, I remember that a huge Bitcoin spike because Iranians were moving money out of Iran ahead of you know bank sanctions or you know they thought Trump was going to start a war and th there's several events that are basically trigger events so if we see a lot more countries their currency collapsing every time that's happened Bitcoin's gone up 10 percent 20 percent 30 percent in a week 
like instantly. And I think Trump, once he gets reelected, I think it's really likely that either Iran's going to blockade that strait or Trump's going to directly oil strike or drone strike the oil refineries in Iran um, in response to, um, you know, this or that. You know, it's been really, you know, they're shooting down aircraft over there. No one will fly over the country. There's a lot of uh, stuff going on behind the scenes that's, uh, you know, pretty crazy. And the Iranians, you know, have billions and billions of dollars of oil money. And if they think the currency is going to be unstable or, you know, that the government's going to collapse or that there's going to be a war every single time, that they've gone and threatened Iran, the Bitcoin price has just skyrocketed as all the Iranians rush to buy Bitcoin in case they have to flee the country or, you know, this or that. So, and they've also the trade sanctions, they can't really use anything else. They can't use US dollars. They can't use euros. They're stuck using Bitcoin. That's the only way to get out. So I think that there's trigger events that are coming up, like the blockchain having, like the instability in, um, in Iran. And this is going to be crazy for Bitcoin. I think that in the last bubble, last run up, we had a little bit of money going to Bitcoin, like a few billion dollars here and there. But if you look at the total wealth in the world and what some of these countries are managing in terms of their sovereign wealth funds, and you consider that they're starting to buy crypto assets for various reasons, like moving money and you know that's it, and, and things like that, like Chinese investors are getting locked out. Like they're they're saying, where's this money coming from? Oh, it's from China. Oh, you need to do a national security review. So they'll you know take the money and they'll move it through Bitcoin. And there's no way they can prove it's Chinese money and things like that. So you're seeing a lot of Chinese just acquiring mass amounts of Bitcoin so that they can buy houses overseas in, in Canada. And I think in when you had coronavirus and things like that, you're gonna have a lot of Chinese leaving China and they're gonna be moving to Vancouver and you know these people bring a lot of money with them and uh, there's a limit on how much you can actually move out of China. So um so a lot of the countries that have capital controls have actually been major drivers of, of Bitcoin adoption because their population is buying these you know, Bitcoin basically to get out of their currency so they can move, uh, you know, buy a house overseas or uh, move assets out of the country. So I think that, so anyway, I think that it's possible that Bitcoin, maybe by Q1, um, one year from now, first quarter, I think that Bitcoin could be in another bubble. I think it could hit over 100,000 at the peak. Um, and then it'll go down a little bit, but the level that it's going to end up at is going to be a lot higher. Uh, than it is today. And if we saw if the trade war between China and the United States continues or U.S. intensifies the sanctions or, you know, seizing more assets of these overseas oligarchs in Russia, you know, some of these guys have $10 billion or $20 billion or $50 billion offshore. And they they bring it to London, they bring it to Dubai, and the U.S. government shows up and says, you got to shut down their accounts. And, um, and they give them a warning and they're moving it here, moving it there. And it's like hot potato money. They have billions of dollars and there's nowhere they can store it because they're, you know, they're being hunted. So a lot of them are starting to move that money seriously into Bitcoin and into places where it can't be frozen. It can't be grabbed. It's hard to track. And th this has been going on for a while now, I would say, uh, since the beginning of Bitcoin. But it's, this time, I think it's more in the mainstream and it's intensified and the asset value of Bitcoin is high enough now where you can actually see like a $10 billion go into Bitcoin and where the person can expect to have enough liquidity that they're able to get $10 billion out. Because I think you can buy, you know, you can get a $10 billion into anything. Anyone will take your $10 billion, but to get the $10 billion back at some point in the future requires some level of liquidity. And um, so I, I think that um, this is going to be the, the third or fourth uh, run up for Bitcoin and then it's going to crash and I think it might settle at a level between, you know, 35, 40,000 to 60,000 after the peak of 100,000. I don't really know what the peak will be. And then I think we'll have another, you know, few years of it just simmering and goes up, goes down, but it's not really moving much. And people get this trough of despair. And then I think we we'll ha might have another run up. But I don't think that run up is going to be more than 30 or 40 percent higher than the current run up, because traditionally, every single time it's gone up, um, it's been smaller. It's still been ridiculous. You know, mm -hmm. going from $1,000 to $10,000 is still a lot, right? Going from $1,000 to $18,000 is 18x. But 
that's nothing compared to going from one penny to a thousand dollars. Yeah, you have like a million x going up, right? And when you've already gone up a million x, what's another fifteen or twenty or three x? You know, another forty percent is just you know it's noise. You don't even see you don't even see that in the in the long term data. So I think that the altcoin markets are coming back, and and I've, there's a project that's actually doing an ICO on Skycoin, uh, on Skyledger that was done by the guys who did Solar Bankers, and I think it's like a Global Brain or um, let me find. Uh, if people want to find out about ICOs on Skycoin, is there a website they can go to, which has? No, the- we're we're really behind. We're we're building a new website, and we are trying to. Um, what is this called? It's called GL Brain. So I think the uh, Carlo uh, from Solar Bank. So Solar Bankers is doing pretty well, and then the, the main guy Alfred died of a heart attack, and that just like wiped him out. So uh, you know, and that that came out of nowhere. He was actually pretty young. And so the Carlo was one of the solar banker guys. So he was doing this ICO. And what I, what I saw was every single ICO failed. It just, no one cared. No one was tweeting it. And then I, we looked at our Twitter feed. And since this guy was using Skyledger, it was just million tweets. They're like drowning us out on Twitter during the, the ICO marketing. And this is the you know first time I've seen an ICO in two years, basically, that isn't dead. Most of the ICOs, I think, have been just completely dead. Mm. Uh, and so I think the market is definitely coming back. And I don't think we're going to see the level of ICOs and the craziness that we saw and uh, you know, the amount of scams and things that we saw um, two years ago at the market peak where it was just crazy. And like every, everyone's uncle and cousin and brother and sisters doing an ICO. I don't think it's going to go back to that. But, um, but I'm definitely seeing more interest now in ICOs and crypto assets and things that basically has been completely flatlined or dead for the last two years. Yeah. So the market's definitely recovering. Yeah, yeah, definitely. One way I know is that the CoinFest UK is happening again. There seems to be more activity in the conference area than there were than there has been last year or whatever, and more interest in meetup groups and stuff. So slowly, and I think people like you, people like myself, because a lot of YouTubers have disappeared in the bear market, and uh, the other the holdouts, the holdouts like me and others or whatever. Right? Okay, there we can sense there is a a shifting in the mood and people are lining themselves up. Projects are lining themselves up. Selves up. Okay. All right. I had, really funny, I had a really funny story. There was, there was this guy, I think it was like Joe Blackburn. He had the largest crypto channel on Facebook and we did, we did some interviews and stuff with him and, and he, you know, brought the Shanghai. Yeah. Yeah. He was in Shanghai. And, um, and you know, so we met in person and it was great. And he, uh, but basically um, he was the biggest crypto channel on Facebook. He had, he had, I don't even know how many, it's like millions of people or something. And um, then you just shut it down because all the co- companies were dead. You know, there, were, there wasn't any activity. There wasn't anything to really talk about. Everyone was leaving the market because everything was just crashing. And I think he moved to like Ecuador or something and like um, moved on a farm and started growing like hemp or like CBD oil. And I'm like, okay, the market is dead. The market is so dead. <laughs> Yes, 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 yes. No, it's going gonna, it's gonna to pick up. It's going to pick up. And uh, I think a lot of people that have stayed and the people that have come back will be more wary about um, ICO projects and stuff. Absolutely. I think it's going to be a lot of the existing projects. I don't think that there's a lot of room for new products in the market. Um, I think a lot of the money, it's going to go everywhere, but I think it's going to go into mainly established projects that, you know, have a history, you know, of, of delivering. And, and we saw when you did ICOs originally, we saw 98% of the coins who raised an ICO just took the money and ran. They didn't even bother to get the asset listed on an exchange. So I had that, you know, we, we built, and they didn't have a blockchain. So they launched a coin and they didn't have developers or they failed at hiring software developers or, you know, this, a lot of things happened. Um, and then of the, like the 1% that got on the exchange, most of them died. They, they ran out of money. They didn't perform. They, you know, whatever happened. And so there, there was a stage that you get through, which is you, you did an ICO, you raised money. Then you actually used them. You got you. So you're, you know, you're on exchange now. You're liquid. You didn't just run away with the money. And then you kept developing and you built something. And mm-hmm. of the projects, of a thousand projects, only maybe five or six out of a thousand actually got to the stage where they're on a market. And they have a history of delivering, and they continued operating, and they didn't go broke. Uh, and that, and then, and then even beyond that is are people using the software? Are they using the chain and the ecosystem? And so I think you know, of course, for Skycoin, we launched like a programming language and our blockchain platform, and we 
finish our mobile wallet and our desktop wallet. And we've, we've built like 25 things so far, and we use hardware products and, you know, and, and just so many things. And um, the, and then, so in this next cycle, I think it's going to be a platform. It's a platform war. And so I think that you're going to see a reshuffling of like Ethereum and the relative rankings, but I think it's mostly going to be a Bitcoin bubble. And then after Bitcoin peaks, then we're going to see a huge flood of money into altcoins because they have a higher potential to go up 10x or 20x or 30x than Bitcoin does. Once Bitcoin's over 80000 or $50,000, like what is it? Is it going to double again? How long is it going to stay there? How many weeks? You know. Um, but some of these coins, some of the smaller projects can go up 50 X, hundred X, or they can, at least, you know, they can at least grow. And another thing is the investors got burned in the last bubble because they invested in assets that didn't have liquidity. So yeah. they'll invest $10 million in some coin, but they can't get their money out. So, um, that was, so they want to see aged coins and have developers and, you know, and have development team and they've been going for a couple of years and haven't run out of money and, uh, you know, haven't abandoned the project and, where there's a liquid market. So, and, and those are the criteria. And then they want to see applications. They want to know why people have to buy this coin to drive the coin price up. Why the, the properties of the coin or, or the operation of their ecosystem will result in liquidity. And so the, the real number of assets that are in the race for the next crypto bubble, I think it's going to be a much larger amount of money going into many fewer assets than we saw in the, in the bubble two years ago. Right, right. Okay. And then one of the, one of the projects that I want to mention is BitTube.tv, and also because it ties into what a lot of crypto YouTubers had to deal with, including myself, right? So they, they've been going for about two years. They were in the interview with you mm -hmm. that we did with the other projects uh, a few days ago. So they've been going for about two years, no ICO, no pre-mine, uh, privately funded. Sabre, the CEO, he's got a couple of other businesses, and he draws money from that to fund BitTube. And they have a censorship-resistant uh, social media platform on which this video will first go out. So I invite people to to subscribe to that. But that's the kind of like it's got an actual product which people can use, which is growing and developing and being refined. Those are the kind of projects that possibly are going to uh, really flourish as more and more people move into the crypto space. And so what are the content? One of the things that we wanted to do with Skycoin is make sure that our growth was basically backed by user growth or adoption. So we focused a lot on like, you know, social media apps or chat apps or like this, you know, broadband internet app, Skywire or uh, blockchain gaming. And if the bubble's coming back, if we're going to be full on like we were in uh, two years ago, where everything's going up 50x and, you know, there was a limited amount of money available and the markets are just crazy. I think we have to start, like, how are we going to do blockchain gaming? How are we going to do messaging apps? How are we going to, you know, we're using our consumer VPN app. And I think it's going to be an emphasis on building applications that use blockchain and that can get huge audiences of 100,000 people or a million people or 10 million people. And so that that is what I, I see because if, even if you have an asset, like, you know, a coin and it has a $5 billion, $5 billion market cap, it doesn't mean anything if no one's actually using it in the real world and it's not going to have a long-term staying power. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Well, now, are you going to be able to scale up quickly enough with the yeah. hardware that you have? Like, you know, let's say a uh, hundred thousand people move in tomorrow and they all want to order a sky miner and a sky wallet and the, the sky wire antenna. As soon as the coronavirus goes away and they open the highways again in China, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> it's really crazy because we, we would do a production run and we would just, uh, and they're going to assemble these parts and these guys would bring like this bag. It was like an 80, 80 kilogram bag and this one little tiny guy was carrying it up to four flights of stairs. And I'm like, and he broke his back or something. He like hurt his back or something. And and I, I couldn't even pick up the bag. And I'm like, what the hell? And I opened the bag and it's just full of nuts. So we had to order like 36,000, like, you know, four millimeter, 40 millimeter, uh, you know, M6 nuts or something. And it's this whole bag full of like nuts and then another bag full of bolts. And then, um, then, then it was crazy. We had like 20, 30 people uh, show up out of nowhere and they just start grabbing the nuts and the bolts and like, you know, like six 
knots in this plastic bag, for, you know, six bolts, six blah, 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 counting them, putting them in these pre-labeled plastic bags. And then some guy was taking the plastic bags and bins and then putting them in a bigger bag that is supposed to have like one bag of nuts and one bag of screws and one bag of like, you know, wires. And then another guy checking it. And then another guy taking that bag with like bags inside of bags, putting it in a, you know, in a package. And, um, and it was just like 20, 30 people show up out of nowhere, like, whoo, and then they assemble like all these, like two tons of sky miners and box them and then ship them out. And we only had like one guy who said he like was missing a nut or something. And it was probably his fault. He probably lost it. So I, I was like pretty, it, it's pretty efficient. And then, uh, so the whole like office got turned into a factory for like two days. And, um, now I don't, we have so much equipment now, I don't even know where we're going to put all these boxes. We have a new office under construction, so I think... Uh, but, but you can't, I mean, but with the coronavirus going on, you can't ship anything out, though, can you? Yeah. I think that'll be resolved by July, you know, June, March, May, June. I think that they mostly have it under control. And I think that, you know, if you look at China, every bus station, every airport, every hotel... Every apartment building has an infrared monitor, and if you have the you know virus, they let they you know quarantine you, and they say who did you talk, who are you with, who's in your family, who's in this, and they're starting to blood test the people, and they they have a you know like a thing now to test the blood for the virus very quickly, and um and they mostly I think have it under control in China because they're just so efficient at like I have employees says they're not allowed to leave their house, mm -hmm. and there's a cam they close all the entrances to the building except one entrance. And there's a camera, infrared camera, uh, being run by the building community. So if anyone in the gets a flu, they're going to get like quarantined within like two hours. You know, they, there's even people that were quarantined for a flu, and the police say go home, don't leave. And the guy's driving on the street, and the license plate reader like tags them, and the police pick them up in five minutes and say, "Hey, why are you leaving your house? You're, you you don't have a flu. What are you doing?" And uh, so they're they're like. China right now is completely on lockdown. So they the virus is gonna be, I think, annihilated unless something else happens or there's like a second virus or you know, some crazy thing. I think that the they're gonna have oh come in. Yeah, so basically I think that China is really on top of the coronavirus. And what I'm seeing now is the other nations, they don't uh, they're doing they weren't doing quarantine measures. So the United States government was letting people fly back from Wuhan and just, you know, letting them run around and like frolic around. They weren't even really like, you know, they were having like self quarantine and this and that. But I don't think basically what I saw now is they're actually turning military bases into quarantine zones. So they are um, preparing for outbreaks in other countries. Um, so these other countries, I don't think have been as serious as, ah, yeah, I pulled a muscle, so I'm like, ah! And um, the, um, yeah, so these other countries are basically, um, you know, they have a lot of tourism and they're not going to shut down the tourism for these, these viruses. Like, uh, for instance, a lot of uh, Chinese go to the Philippines and they go to Thailand and whatever. And if they were to stop tourism from China, like all their hotels would go under. So they want to quarantine the virus, but they don't want to, uh, you know, they can't shut down the tourist industry. So <laughs> they, you know, it's a real problem. And so I think, uh, so China's already in full blown, um, uh, you know, disaster relief mode and, they have it locked down, but these other countries, um, I don't think they have the measures in place that China did, does. So I think it's definitely going to, if the, you know, the coronavirus is mostly going to impact other countries outside China. Right, 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 right. Okay. And then I wonder if how well, I, I don't know, how well it's, it will survive or thrive in hot climates or in the summer, if anything, because people don't generally catch the flu in the summer. They don't tend to get cold in the summer which may have something to do with the amount of vitamin D that people are getting. So I'm making sure that I'm fully stocked up on vitamin D. Um, one of the funny things, so these viruses, they start out very lethal, like a bowl of like 90%, 50% fatality rate. And then the virus that kills the people too fast gets weeded out. So they become less lethal over time, but they affect more people. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't even be surprised, you know, so typically like the most of the deaths are the first people and then you have like hundred million people infected and it's, you know, they're, they just get flu basically. So there's like a tendency for the more mild form of the virus to spread faster than the other forms. But this one's really weird because the people, they said the people were like shedding viruses for like two weeks, three weeks before they were getting symptoms. So it's a, 
you know, it's just crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Now, so you say you're ready for scale up, for scale up, once the coronavirus <laughs> restrictions are over. But you're, so our scale up isn't mostly the hardware production. That's not the, that's really easy for us to do. Right. Our, the really hard thing is to get software developers. So imagine I want to do like 12 video games, right? Mm -hmm. I want to do like Kitty Cash Poker. I want to have a Kitty Cash Casino. I want to, you know, I want to start showing off the programming language that we built and showing off blockchain development. I want to have developers come in and get some of these this decentralized social media apps, you know, onto our platform. So I need to hire a team of like three guys to do Twitter, three guys to do Telegram. I have to hire a team of three guys to do 4chan, three guys to do a BBS system. And they have to, you know, work for three to six months. And if our screening's good, maybe a third of them or only a third of them are going to flop out and be useless. And we're not going to find out like the team's not producing anything for three months. We do 12 projects and we deliver eight of them. And, you know, we're doing pretty good, eight out of 12. Um, although we're actually usually better than that. And, uh, or, but it's always m longer than you think it would take. So instead of eight months, like we'll get the prototype working in three weeks. And then, you know, the, it takes a year to fix all these freaking bugs and, and stuff that you couldn't even imagine when you started it. And so, uh, for us, um, we have to be ready to be able to hire 50 developers or 60 developers to bring in a lot of college students uh, or people, you know, experience, have them work for a month or two to see if they can get stuff done. And if they're good, if they need a lot of handholding, I don't want to deal with them in the bubble because, you know, sometimes it can take two years to get rid of people's bad habit. You know, they did this job. This is how I did it, my last job, blah, blah, blah. You know, they don't communicate correctly. They're, they're not precise. They're, you know, they, they need to be told what to do, you know, every step, they, they, they stop working, they don't have initiative, they, they, uh, they feel scared that they're going to get like, someone's going to yell at them if they do anything unless someone tells them, you know, there's a lot of things that people have in their head that like hold them back from software development. And, 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 and in my company, like I give people lists of 85 things and all 85 of them are done. And if they're not, I'd be like ready to murder someone. So, uh, or that, you know, I had a guy and I said, these 11 things. And there were like 11 things that have to be in place, right? And he comes, he gets like eight of them. And he says, yeah, yeah, it's all done. It's all done. Like, all oh, you did eight? Yeah, yeah. Nine? Yeah, yeah. 10? You did it? Yeah. You're sure? Yeah. Then I had this other guy come in and check. And he's like, well, 11 wasn't done. I checked it. And, like, and I said, did you do 11? And he says, no. And I said, why did, when I asked you if you did 11, why'd you say yes? Why do you, I said, why'd you say it was done if you did it? And he says, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Like, what? Like, uh, so like, why, so like, don't say no when you mean yes. Don't say yes when you mean no. So this is like, really, you know, it should be really common sense, right? Like, mm -hmm. don't say no when you mean yes. Don't say yes when you mean no. And you, and you, people can learn like how to think and how to get organized and do this. But in the middle of a freaking bubble where like everything is going up 50x and we have to deliver something in eight months.